وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك ومن ثم أما بعد respected elders, sisters and brothers السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته um, allow me just to uh, inform you that I'm, I'll be speaking for about half an hour tonight and then we will uh, we will leave the uh, the platform or the podium open for any Q&A and the same will happen tomorrow as well I'll begin with some of the questions that some of you have already written down because I've got them on me and then I'll take any question from the floor inshallah. We are still talking about the 12 points I spoke to you about in regard to achieving the mission statement. Just to recap on the two uh, uh, objectives or the two points that we spoke about so far. The first one was to enhance the quality of life of individual Muslims and their families and number two, to achieve inner peace by having a better understanding of Islamic law. The third point that I would like to discuss with you tonight is to equip Muslim youth in particular with sound knowledge about their faith. Why, you may ask, because we sincerely believe that our youth are encountering the most serious challenge to their faith under the impact of the godless culture of modernity that they live under. Muslim youth and other youth are being asked to give up certain family and social values that were part and parcel of their identity, or in fact, it formed part and parcel of their identity. And to adopt in its place a sense of self-alienation and become a self-estranged imitator of everything called modern. Whether they truly understand what modernity is or they don't understand what modernity is all about. So much so that we ask ourselves at time the following. What happens to the faith of our young people when they leave home to enter college or university? Do they take it with them? Do they leave it at home? Do they sell it? Do they barter it? What do they do with it? You know, and often we are confronted with these challenges. Do they take their faith along with other belonging and necessities of life? Or do they leave faith behind at home? This is, this is partly related to the degree and type of faith practice at home initially. Many young people and their young faculty during college years take a vacation from religion because they see religion regulating their lifestyle or rather restricting their lifestyle. The new freedom that they encounter would include freedom from God himself, not alone from religion, but from God himself. This is the time that I also take a vacation from God himself. The new freedom that they encounter includes freedom from God because without God in their own perception and the culture around them, everything becomes possible in their desires and behavior. Religion is given a tertiary place in their life. The primary being science and the secondary being social pleasures. The downsizing of religion, however, is due to the elimination of God from daily life. At campus, they have new friends and they gain new experiences and adventures. They learn from the oldest students who are there before them 
and they have a challenge to be accepted and to belong to a particular social club. Their lives are busy and they have deadlines to meet and appointments to keep. They are under P pressure or more appropriately B pressure because now they are in a completely different culture altogether. It's not just the P pressure, it's everything that comes with it as well at that new setup. Thus, they have no time for God, at least in the first year of campus life. This is mostly true for those who did not come through a strong religious background or affiliation at home as well. How do they return to religion, however? In the latter part of campus life, by observation and experience, they realize that religion has some influence on morality and thus it has a role in shaping their future. It is their religious morality which keeps them out of trouble as otherwise they might be a victim of violence, theft, drug abuse, alcohol and other matters related such as date rapes, etc. which are prevalent in campus life and you cannot avoid it or escape it unless you have a strong moral system and no one has an immunity against these challenges unless you have a strong principle system within you otherwise you would see yourself drifting without even knowing that you are actually drifting in these challenges that faces our youth in campus life Sometimes even a minor encounter with the law in the state of so-called innocent fun. Because you know English language has some incredible ways of describing things. Can't we have innocent fun? What is that supposed to mean? Tell me, can you describe to me what innocent fun means? Alright? So that we can understand what is that you are encountering that you consider to be innocent fun, right? Is innocent fun something that will implicate the rest of your life just simply because you are chillaxing momentarily for a few minutes here and there and you will pay of your own life and your own repute and your own integrity simply for the so-called innocent life that students encounter when they go abroad or when they go into campus life. Once they go into this so-called innocent fun, this innocent fun can ruin their record and, and career. Some of this fun is much below the intellectual level of decency, yet they still call it innocent fun. Although it amounts to something which is the sound intellect of a normal human being, regardless whether he's religious or not, would detest something called as such as innocent fun. The so-called new age of rationalism is categorized by its claim as the source of all human values that could be derived by each individual without any reference to a sacred authority such as God or the, reveal, or the revealed messages, i.e. everyone wants to seek his own standard of morality without any benchmark or against any benchmark. But the danger in doing so, especially to a young mind, is that what you see as good, someone may see as bad. What you see as okay, someone may see as harmful. What you may see as innocent fun, someone else may see as harmful outcome of certain engagement in certain work that could affect the rest of your existence and the rest of your life. While secularism, on the other, on the other hand, can find the role of religion to the private domain of an individual, creating the dichotomy, which is the separation of different or concrete things between spiritual and mundane, between private and public. Meaning, secularism endorses and encourages what is wrong for wrong or what is God for God. 
right? And what is very funny in the misunderstanding of Islam as a way of life is when people mix the issues together. For example, I may view something as haram in a certain setup or harmful, but in another setup, I can legitimize the same haram because it suits me in that situation. For example, I may look at adultery as something abhorrent. I may look at alcohol as something abhorrent, but cheating at work to achieve my ends is legitimized. Why? Because, come on guys, it's work, we have to cheat. Right? It's okay. I have to bribe, otherwise things won't get done. Right? And then we complain about the system when we are the one that feed the corruption and the system. Why? Because it suits us. Huh? And that is the very thing that Imam Hussein Salamullah spoke against when he said, Imam Hussein said what? Religion is nothing more than something that people chew. You know when you have pan? You chew it, huh? Over and over and over again. Huh? To claim that you are religious. Ah, Bana, are we doing A'mal of Laylatul Qadr tonight? Ah, oh, yeah, excellent. Huh? Let's go and finish it. Are we going for Atikaf? Good on those who go for Atikaf. May Allah bless them, you know, and reward them. But is your Atikaf that you are in solitude with Allah is gonna stop you from going into the breach of what Allah does not want you to breach in your practical aspect of your life? If it does not stop you, then that is what Imam Hussein is talking about. Religion is something that we do, but when we are being put to the test, little are the ones that remain steadfast towards their principles. Only few of these people will hold fast to their religiousness in a practical sense. And not only that, we pride ourselves on, you know, uh, cheating, or double standard, or monopoly, or, or, or exploiting the market, all under what? All under the name of what? The situation we are in forces us to be or to do something like that. The same happens with our youngsters. Why? Because the youngsters learn from the masters and the masters are the parents. Right? Someone who wants his son not to tell lies, he does not himself practice lies at home. For example, if someone goes home and the father wants his son to always be truthful, yet the father himself teaches lying in practical ways. Someone calls and the son says, Dad, someone on the phone. I'm not at home. Yeah, you tell him I'm not at home. Ah, sorry, uncle. Dad is not at home. Okay, we shut the phone. Dad is not at home. Now that same guy, the same student, goes to college, his father asks him, how's your religion going? 100% but he drinks. 100% but he's got 16 girlfriends. Dad, don't worry, don't you trust me? Come on, Dad, you raised me. You know, he's already telling lies because he saw it in action. Why would he stop? It's already been taught to him. It's already been fed to him in that way or another. And then we claim to be what? The standard bearers of faith. We are the ones who touch the alams. And we are the ones who hold the alams. And we are the ones who honor the alams. And so on and so forth. And the list goes on and on. Right? There is always a double standard in what is practical and what is not practical. And we need and we owe it to our children who go abroad in particular to safeguard their system of morality on the basis of what they see at home. Secularism denied religion and its mediating institutions like for example the masjid and public, uh, any public function and influence 
in shaping matters of public policy. Under the denomination of rationalism and secularism, there were questions about the significance of religion in the modern man and woman's life. Amidst all this confusion, and in the mindset of our youth, parents must equip their children with the tools of survival in this challenging world they are living in or under. Here is where parents must realize the importance of the hadith, which is narrated on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib on positive parenting. What is positive parenting, you may ask, brothers and sisters? In the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib, is to train, teach, and raise your children to a time different than the time you were raised in. Don't deal with them on the same frame of mind that your parents raised you in because the challenges are different and the time is now different. What may have worked for me, it does not necessarily work for my child. If something my father has implemented in raising me in a given situation, it may not work for my child or for my daughter in today's world. And Imam Ali spoke about this 1400 years ago. He knew the time will constantly change and we have to evolve with time. Train, teach and raise your children to a time different to the time you were raised in. In other words, positive parenting is an approach to parenting that aims to promote children's development and manage children's behavior in a constructive and non-harmful way. You know, that condescending way of speaking to our children does not work. That way of using authoritarian commands at home what i say must go if you don't like it take tarik road okay it's either my way or the freeway eh? there is no sense of give and take between the authority and the ones that are living under that authority it is based positive parenting on good communication and positive attention to help our children develop and grow positively. We were grown up at home on a negative pattern. Everything we do, God is going to come into it and choke the hell out of us. Right? That's how we were raised. You do something wrong, you drop a, 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 a glass of water, or you are already in Jahannam. Already! You know, especially if this glass of water happens to be, you know, like some fine China or, or some Swiss or some, I don't know, Scandinavian crystal, God help you. Huh? If you drop the vase at home, you're already on that, you know, skewer that turns the lamp. Allah is already barbecuing you inside. That's what we were taught. God is going to kill you, God is going to choke you, God is going to hang you from your hair, God is what, I don't know what, all these funny things that even God sometimes I think sits there and says, where do these parents get this nonsense from? <laughs> you know? I'm not sitting there waiting for one of the children to do something wrong, to lash at him. God doesn't behave in that way. God called himself Halib. Halib, not the thing you eat. Huh? Halim in the sense that he is extraordinary compassionate, extraordinary patient with his, you know, uh, 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 subject to such an extent that Allah is the one that appeals to us to come back to, even when we are running away from him, let alone for Allah to lash at us and wanting to barbecue us. No! He says, my 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 servant my servant look what he said your evil is coming up to me while my blessings are descending down upon you no matter how far you go you will never find the doctor that can heal you like me so i await you to come back to me so i can heal your defects and shortcomings where do you find such a doctor huh where do you find such a healer? 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appeals and says, My clemency and my mercy and my love is overwhelming. Even if you wander and heather and heather away, I shall not wander in the opposite direction away from you. You run away from me and I keep chasing after you. This is the God that we need. The positiveness of attaching God with our children or with our youth. And attaching our youth with that kind of God. Because that's how he wants to be known. He doesn't want to be known on his attribute of power. He wants to be known on his attribute of mercy. You know? We have in the attributes of Allah, the attributes of Jamal and the attributes of Jalal. Allah wants to be known on the attribute of beauty, not on the attribute of power. We have reversed the cycle. We introduce God to our children on the attributes and the basis of power. So much so that they feel choked. Huh? And they cannot wait for the opportunity to go to college because that is their free time from God. As I mentioned earlier, this is the opportunity. Thank God, mom and dad are sending me to, I don't know where, you know, Italy, will America, will Canada. At least I don't have to deal with them for the next four years. Yeah, I mean, I'll come for holidays, doesn't matter, you know. I'll bear with them for two months or so, but I know where I'm going back to. I'm going back to my free time and my indulgence in what I find and feel is what I want. It is based on good communication and positive attention to help children develop and grow in a positive atmosphere. For youth or for children or for our kids who grow up with positive parenting are likely to develop the skills and feel good about them. They are also less likely to develop behavior problems. You find them growing naturally. They're not complex kids. The minute someone speaks to them, it's like someone invaded their space. Chill, yeah? Stay away. Don't come near me. I don't want to know you. Now, at least. But when the space opens for them, they want to include everyone, the bad and the good. The bad and the good. Because now it's the opportunity that has hit in their life and they want to take every possible advantage of it. What are some of the things that we need to train our children on in order to ensure their survival and safety in such environments? There are about 12 points that we need to discuss. Strength in their faith is of utmost importance. In their faith, strength in their faith even when they are being challenged, they do not change their mind just to fit with the crowd. Huh? Someone challenged them. What proof is there that God exists? We fall. When we go to college life, someone says, you believe in God. You know, you come from a family that believes in God. So you think it's normal to say yes. The minute you say yes, you take meat. Because the culture in college is a godless culture. The culture in society is a godless society. They don't want you. In fact, you feel so much shy these days to say the word God that even in the course of your conversation, so that you won't be caught out as a believer, instead of saying God, you say, gosh, ah, this guy is good. You know? He doesn't believe in God even when he's joking. You know? So, it's good. You're doing the right thing. We don't want to even mention the word, you know, God, so that we will not be implicated as being someone who belongs to the family of believers. To be able to achieve that, parents need to be available for their children. This does not mean being with them at all the time, but it means being available when our children need help, care and attention help our children learn by encouraging them to try things for themselves. Encouragement and positive attention help motivate our children to learn more and more. When you see them doing something you like, pay more attention and show them 
that you like what they are doing and they will be more likely to do it again and excel at it. Don't! And I beg every parent, and please pass on the message to every parent, whatever you do, don't ever make the mistake of taking your child's self-esteem away from him. He could never recover from the shock. Because the worst thing that a parent could do to his children is to take their self-esteem and confidence from them. They will never gain it back. They will always feel that they miss something in their life. And they are always missing something of their intellect. And these are not my words. Go and ask psychologists and they will tell you this. They will tell you that a child's confidence is primarily built at home, not in the outside environment, not even at school. And that's why sometimes you find children excelling better at school than others because of that instilling of self-confidence at home by the parents. If you are a teacher, if you are a parent, if you are a mentor, if you are an educator, if you are a maulana, if you are a sheikh, if you are whatever you are, you must always instill self-confidence in the one that you feel you have a responsibility towards and you feel that you owe them that much of your teaching and if you are mentoring. Pride in being who they are. They must not hide the characteristic that identifies them as Muslims and cause them to be different from those around them. In addition, they should be telling others about their faith and are themselves good living examples of what a practical human Muslim they are. So that when people look at them, they say, you know what? It's not what people say Muslims are, because there are good Muslims around. But if I hide my identity because of the Islamophobia that is spreading like wildfire in the world today, then who's going to come and change the paradigm of thinking in regard to the fact that Islam is a way of life that is capable to be part and parcel of the modern world that we are living in. And not only be part and parcel of it, but to complement it and even at times to lead it. But I don't think the version of Islam that we have today can lead even a community, let alone a society or the world. Huh? Because of the way we carry on with our differences and the way we carry on with our own mindset. Capable and skillful. Our children, they are able to learn or we, we must instill in them the ability to learn new things with relative ease. They utilize information in order to achieve the best and most efficient results. Now, this is the question. Where are the parents that sit with their children and read something? Non-existent. What do we do instead? We buy them an iPad. Okay? Go and read yourself. And instead, what do our children go and read? And if I speak, people will say, this sheikh is too much. He speaks about sexuality too much. Well, if I don't speak and warn, and we fall into the trap, then we say, our leaders never told us about these things. Huh? They always kept quiet about them. When we discuss them, you are doomed. When you don't discuss them, you are damned. So, where do you end up? Where do you... You know what? Are you waiting for our kids to be taught about sexuality in schools at the hand of people that see sexuality is a personal preference that even if you felt about yourself that it's good to be gay, then it is good. Okay, go and be gay. Is that what you want others to tell your children? And you don't want Maulana to speak about these things. Why? Because what does Maulana know about sexualism? Let him talk about Salah. Let him talk about Rosa. You know, let him talk. Yet Quran discusses these issues openly in order to be aware of our responsibilities towards these issues. But no, 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 no. We should not. You know, Maulanas are not made for this. What Maulanas are made of? To take people to Jahannam. You know? To speak about Fishari Qabr, scare the living daylight out of you for three, four hours, you know? That you will be so stiff you can't even leave your seat anymore. 
you know? Please, don't bow down. Wallah al -Azim. Someone sent me a text all the way from Dar es Salaam. He says, you know, we have such good Mawlana's here. I said, yes, what are they talking about, social issues? He said, no, they're talking about Fishar and Qabr for three and a half hours. I said, good, Mubarak. Good for you, inshallah, that these people are teaching you about Fishar and Qabr. Inshallah, you'll succeed in this dunya and in Akhirah. Okay, on the basis of this. So Imam Ali says, live to a time which is different to your time, and we are still thinking and, you know, applauding the promoters of Fishari Khabar. I don't have anything against it, but I think everything in moderation is good. Everything in moderation, which Allah speaks about in the Quran. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about in the Quran? He says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Allah says, we made you what a moderate nation. You are always in the middle. You don't go to either extreme. You don't become a fundu. Is that the word you use? I don't know. Extremist. All right. You don't become so liberal to such an extent that nothing matters anymore. Everything to you is halal. On the other side, everything is haram. But where do we draw the line? You know, you get these the children so confused that they go to one group, everything is haram, they, their mentality busts. Because they go, they go very deep into religion. Deep, 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 haram, 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 haram. His mind can't take it. He flips 180 degrees. He becomes the, the completely the opposite. And then when he becomes completely the opposite, that's it, he's gone, he's finished. You can't bring him back anymore because he's given up on something called religion. He doesn't even want to know it anymore because of the way it's being taught. And we lose them in the process because what's done, what's done, damage is done. And that is due to taking their self-confidence away from them. We must instill motivation in them. They seek out information and anything else which is needed at every opportunity. Whenever possible, they help out in various worthwhile causes. What I'm trying to say is that we have to instill that motivation in them. Go and volunteer. Go and lend yourself to others. Go and serve in some places. Don't hand life to your children on a silver platter. Because if you do, and they are faced with a challenge, they will collapse because they don't know how to handle themselves. Because they've never been there in the first place. They don't know how to handle it. Everything comes to them. From the minute they are born to the minute they die, they don't even know how to wash a pair of socks. Huh? Because, alhamdulillah, there is 13,000 maids at home. Ooh, you know, there is the washing machine. They don't even know. Oh, I know children who reach the age of 27 years old. They're not married, still living at home. They don't even know how to do their beds. They wait for Her Highness, the mom, to come and do it for them. And you know, we complain. Our children are so lazy, so lethargic. They make me sick. Sorry to use the language. And you know what? The, the mom comes sit next to that 27. Uh, John, you're okay today? You want breakfast in bed? I will bring it for you. But you are telling him. You are telling him, be as lazy as you can because I'll always be there for you to be lazy. You know? And then when he gets up to wash himself, the mom goes and does the bed. He comes back, everything is fixed. He said, I have the best mom in the world. You know? And now he aspires for a similar wife. And when the wife does not ascribe to the standard of his mom, there is no marriage life anymore. Why? Because his expectation are that of his mother's expectation. She is the best cook, the best housewife, the best cleaner, the best this, the best thing. So his expectation of marriage is what? When you marry a wife, you marry a vacuum cleaner, an <laughs> oven, a dishwasher, and a washing machine. These are the qualities of a good wife. That's what we are teaching our children, right? And if we take that away from them, and we start to teach them practicality, like the Prophet Wasallam taught us practicality in the sense that he did everything himself, Salawat Everything the Prophet did 
himself. One of our maraja of taqlid sends a letter once to his wife. In that letter, you know what he says to her? He says, I am in Beirut. Beirut is a beautiful city. Because, but the, this is a marja. Wallah, these are the words of a marja. He says, Beirut is a beautiful city. He has gone to Beirut for a visit. He says, Beirut is a beautiful city. But you know, the only thing missing in Beirut is you. His wife. Yet, yet, his wife comes to speak after his death. To describe what kind of a person he was and what sort of a marja he was. She says, when he lived with me, we lived together for 60 years. Not once he asked for a glass of water from me. He's a marja. And what do we think about our marja? You know, they said do nothing. Okay? This guy, he says, not once his wife, he asked her for a glass of water. In fact, he said, in fact, he used to come home and he used to find her preparing food and washing the clothes at the same time. That's what he used to tell her. Didn't I tell you many times, when you want to perform a task, don't do task, two tasks together, because that's too taxing on you. Subhanallah. What are you doing? Just washing the dishes? All day you just wash the dishes? No, 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 you must do everything because you're a robot. You're not a human being. You must do everything under the sun. That's when marriages fail. Because the expectations of our children are not there. Because it can't match the mom at home. Because we don't have daughters that are being taught the same, you know, tradition also. Because all of a sudden, subhanAllah, the mom wants to do that to the children and to their kids. But she tells her daughter, don't you dare let him take a, back, a ride on your back. Why are you taking your children to take a ride on your back? Huh? But when it comes to the... To the wife, don't you dare let him take a ride on your back. Whenever possible, they help out. We must encourage them to help out in various worthwhile causes. And parents must encourage them to do so by having to join them at times in these activities. Don't push your child to sport and you go and chill in the golf club. Sorry, I don't know any other place to use. But for example, yeah. Don't say, oh, you know, you, you want the driver to take you to the soccer game? I'll, I'll get him, go. But dad, I would like you to come with me. Oh, Allah, son, I don't have time. So that guy, that child becomes heartbroken because he see other dads waiting there and cheering their sons on while this son has no one to cheer him. You know, his self-confidence drops to the, you know, rock bottom. But he wants his dad. He wants his dad. He wants a role model figure in his life to look up to. And we don't provide it sometimes. We need to develop in them what we call a strong personality. They always present their personal opinion and often try to convince people of their point of view. They do not change their mind easily. And they enjoy talking from a leadership position, not from a follower position. So when they are in a discussion group, they are not with the flow. Well, if the majority says yes, we will say yes. But maybe the majority are saying yes to something wrong. Doesn't matter. I, I can't express myself. I'm not saying make them stubborn. No. This is positiveness in instilling them the ability to express their point of view. Right from a small, you know, age. There was a child. I've taken much of your time. I'll try to reduce my speech. I'm about to. This example, and I'll carry on tomorrow, inshallah. This example, and I'll carry on tomorrow. The Prophet وسلم, was seated once in a majlis. Okay? Next to him, it happened that there was a child who was about 13, 14 years old. The UISS. Now, the Prophet was brought a glass of milk, a jar of milk. So, they gave it to the Prophet. The Prophet does not drink out of his courtesy. He waits for everyone else to drink. Then, if there is anything left over, he will drink it. If not, doesn't matter. So, he goes to the child. Son, see all these elders sitting in the majlis. The, the young boy says, yes, Ya Rasulullah, I can see them. 
He says, can I pass your turn to them and then we'll give you the milk out of respect to your elders? Look what the child says. In our children, he'll probably drop dead already. Already he's blushing or he's shivering. He's developed Parkinson's disease all of a sudden. He doesn't know what to do. You know, especially because he is in the company or in the presence of such a what? A grander personality like the Prophet ﷺ, right? Just like for example, I used to remember when we were kids, when a Maulana used to come, we used to hide behind our parents. Yeah, he doesn't bite. You know? But we have been told, don't go near Maulanas. They have a special, you know, station. Okay, good to teach them respect, but not to the extent that they become fearful of even approaching or asking. Then how do they find out about their religion if they are frightened of him? You can't. Okay. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I speak? He says, Yes, you can. He says, I am seated to your right hand side. Right or wrong? The Prophet said, Yes. He said, You taught us priority is given to the one who sits on your right hand side. He said, yes. He said, since I'm sitting on my right side, uh, right hand side, and you are the prophet, and you've touched that milk first, I'm not going to give my turn to anyone. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Is, am I saying anything wrong, Ya Rasulullah? He said, no. You argued your point immaculately. You argued. The prophet did not denounce him. He did not say, who raised you, man? <laughs> what audacious kid? No, he didn't say that. He didn't break his self-confidence. He didn't kill his self-esteem. He said, you know, you argued your point in a very beautiful way. Brothers, elders, sorry, I have to give the milk to him. The child takes the milk. Look, 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 look. Takes the milk. He said, Ya Rasulullah, now I will pass it on to my elders. Subhanallah. Now I will pass it on to my elders. At least I made my point and this is my heart. Okay, what do you do after that? It's your derogative, right? Or prerogative. Your prerogative, what you do. Your choice, what you do. But be able to express your point. Don't allow people to hijack your identity simply because you went to Harvard University or, or, or that now you're going to come back after four years of medicine or eight years of PhD and you're going to tell your parents or the community you live in, I still believe in God? Sure. It's too much, man. Huh? No, it's not possible. No, it's possible and how? Because you have a paradigm that you want to give to the world that you should be proud of in expressing in a logical and rational way because of your love for your identity and the confidence that your parents instilled in you. Anyway, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in conclusion, allow us and grant us the wisdom and the ability to be in that position so that we can instill this uh, positive parenting in our children so that we can achieve what we need to achieve in the appropriateness and the measures of raising them in a healthy and appropriate way. With this I conclude wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibina al-tahirin. The young uh, sister here who has papers and pens, if you need to ask a question, just point to her inshallah and she'll gracefully be attending to you to write whatever you want to ask of her. I'll start with the first question. Is there any book available with the translation or tafsir of the Quran by our Imams? Yeah, there are a few, uh, uh, like there is a tafsir of uh, Imam al kadhim salam Allah but I don't know whether it's available in English. I don't know whether it's available. I know it's available in, in, in Arabic. Or this tafsir, at least it's attributed to Al-Imam uh, As-Sadiq, uh, uh, sorry, Imam Al-Qadim, uh, Ali. So there are, if you Google or if you, for example, go to alislam.org, I'm sure you would definitely find something along those lines. Um, okay, you said a few days ago that women uh, were made from the same substance as men by Allah. Women have the same intellect as men, no difference. The question, my question is, why cannot a woman be a prayer leader just as a man in a mosque? You know why? Because men can't take it. <laughs> All right? Simple. And uh, if I speak, people will also raise their eyebrows. 
When a woman, you know, our salah is physical, right? And it involves certain physical activities that some men, if the woman is to lead in prayer and be engaged in certain physical activities of that sort, they will say, not Allahu Akbar anymore. God knows what is Akbar after that. Okay? It's nature. I mean, if someone, let alone standing in front of you, if she's sitting, if she is standing beside you, if a woman is standing beside you, are you going to think about Allah anymore? Seriously. Seriously. You know, and they think, yani, Islam is sexist. Islam does not want... No, no, Islam is not sexist. Islam is a religion that is practical, that wants to avoid... And here, I'm not saying all men are. Again, as I said three days ago, when God legislates, He legislates at the minimum capabilities of people. Not at the maximum capability. Yani, for example, there could be men who even if a thousand women was with them in one room and they were alone with her, they would not be affected. They have that, you know, uh, power of control. But there are men, if they just see the breeze of a woman, okay? If they see just the shade of a woman, they collapse. So that's his capability. He cannot control it. So Allah wants, knows that some men are of that caliber. He goes and he puts the woman right there smack in the middle of the prayer. It's not going to work in that regard. It's not going to work in that regard. So God takes into perspective these issues uh, uh, in that reference. The other issue why she cannot be a leader in the mosque, for example, is for the obvious psych physiological reasons that a woman goes through in her, you know, cycle of the month, that she cannot be available to lead at certain time in that. So she can't, she's not there, so what do, what do the men do? She's not there, but she's the leader of the mosque, for example. So in that time of the month, what do they do? So that is another dimension as to why uh, she is exempt from leading the prayers in front of men. In our Shia community, there is a lot of emphasis on khums, but not on zakat. Why? And is zakat payable by the Shia community? Can you please clarify whether there is any ayat in the Holy Quran relating to khums? Yeah, of course. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse 41, Surah Al-Anfal, Allah speaks very clearly about the question of Khums, he says, فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ مَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسُهُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِذِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْفُقَرَاءِ وَكَذَا وَكَذَا You know, it lists the items or the divisions in which the Khums is paid. However, to say that Zakat is not payable or it's not part of being payable in the jurisprudential of the Shia school of thought is not entirely correct because we know that in the Shia school of thought, for example, zakat is paid on what we call the four ayan and on gold and silver. Once gold and silver reaches a particular uh, uh, level, yani for example, if you have, if you are dealing or you trade in gold and you reach 81 grams of gold, you have 81 grams, which is not much actually, you know, 81 grams. People have kilos of gold these days, but we're not talking about gold of, of uh, that you wear, the, the gold of Zina, as they call it, the gold of ornament. Uh, we're talking about gold for trading, as in a trading system. If it reaches 82 grams, then 2.5% becomes payable on the gold. Silver, cattle, and the four uh, crops, which have to be, if you are a farmer, for example, and you deal with wheat, rice, uh, uh, and uh, and this type of uh, uh, of crops, then you have to pay homes on that particular, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, crops or the cattle that you are dealing with as a business. So zakat becomes payable from that perspective. However, to flip the, 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 the coin, our Sunni brothers also have a concept of homes. And it is not limited only to war booties, as some people think. No. In fact, our Sunni brothers, in their four school of thought, 
which is the Hanafi, the Hanbali, the Maliki, and the Shafi'i, state clearly, without an iota of doubt, that everything that is buried underground and has value to it, it accrues khums. Yani, you pull out uranium, you pay khums on it. Magnesium, you pay khums on it. Oil, you pay khums on it. So imagine if the Muslim world pays the homes on the oil that is dug out from underground. I don't think anyone will be driving anything less than a Bentley, right? But and unfortunately, but it is not being paid. So don't think that even in the Sunni school of thought, for example, that uh, the homes is restricted to war booties. Yani, if you go to a battle and you the the you, you, the, the enemy leave behind whatever they leave behind, whatever you gain, you pay fifth of that, no, or twenty percent of that. That's not entirely true either. In fairness to our brothers and sisters in the, in the uh, other school of thought. Uh, what was the last? One? Yeah. Uh, is zakat give, uh, given payable? on yearly income or on total wealth. Khums is calculated how? Well, Zakat, as I said, once you reach the quorum of a particular thing that you have, you pay Zakat according to our interpretation of Zakat. The interpretation of Zakat according to the Sunni school of thought is you pay two and a half of your saved income. Two and a half percent of your saved annual income. Yani, let's say, I am someone that works, I earn a salary of $100,000, for example. I saved out of the $100,000, $20,000. One year lapsed on that $20,000 and I did not use it. Okay, I have to pay 2.5%. It doesn't stop here. If the next year comes and I have not used the same $20,000, I still have to pay another 2.5%. Okay? Yeah, you could reach a time where the $20,000 are gone if you're not using them. Because you have to keep paying the 2.5% every year if you do not use that saved money. How is homes calculated? Homes calculated after you pay all your expenses, all right? Necessary expenses. Okay? You can't say, okay, I, I have a, a Rolls, now I feel like a Bentley. No, you pay homes on the Bentley and buy it, no problem. Because it's not an expense, it's not a necessity, it's a leisure. All right? You want to buy it and you have the money, go ahead. No problem, but pay homes on it first. There is no problem. So, homes is calculated. You pay all your expenses, rent, mortgage, uh, food. For what? For a whole year. All the necessary expenses for one whole year. After you paid all your expenses for a whole year, you had surplus of money that remained for a year unused, you pay 20% on that money. You pay 20% on that particular amount and not on the entire amount that you are earning at face value. When children are sick, we as parents pray to Allah for giving them health and make them well. But mostly, my du'as are not answered. Why? Is it that we are not good Muslims or that the child who is sick is not very religious and not a good Muslim? Please, when you relate to Allah, don't relate to Him from a vengeance point of view. Why? Because Allah said, He Himself said, all right? Allah said to Ibrahim, when Ibrahim left his family near the sacred mosque. Remember, you know the ayah that speaks about it. He said, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْحَرَامِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ لِي زَرَى Oh Allah, I left members of my family near your sacred home in a barren valley. Mecca was barren, there is no... Just فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِ Please let people flock to them so that they could help them. Because he left his wife, Hajar, and his son, Ismail. 
وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَةِ and provide them with means of sustenance مَنْ آمَنَ مِنْهُمْ what does he say? he said provide those who flock to them with sustenance but only the believers among them Ibrahim said that what did Allah reply? he said وَمَنْ كَفَرْ he said no 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 we don't only provide for the believers among them we will also provide for the non-believers as well. So if someone comes, because sustenance is a duty on Allah to give to people, right? So he does not implicate someone who has no uh, burden, or has not done any sin by the sins of his parents. We have been told, by the way, that the Ariwayat, it says that if a parent goes against Allah, the child pays the price. But how is that possible? Tell me, how is that possible when Allah Himself in the Quran declares and says, "Wala tazir waziratan wizra ukhra"? No soul shall be burdened by the action of another soul. How is it possible then we can come and claim that if the parent is not good, the son will suffer the consequences? That is injustice, and Allah cannot be unjust. Because he made that law, I shall not burden a soul with the defects or the shortcomings or the sins or the mishaps or whatever of another soul. So why would the children pay the price? Now, why is it then sometimes our prayers are not answered? Okay. Firstly and primarily, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your uh, dua, all right? He knows better than you whether this dua should be given now, in five years, in ten years, or not given at all. So that you don't think it's gonna come one day. Alright? It may not come at all. Why? Because sometimes God preserves preserves your dua to the day of judgment, to raise your rank in that day. Because he sees fit that if he's going to give it to you now, you may lose this world and the other. Yeah, and for example, for example, Karun. Karun was the cousin of Musa. Salam Allah. He was poor, but he was ultra, ultra religious. Yeah, and whatever Moses does, Karun will do. He was, they call him the pigeon of the temple. And he was always in the temple, you know or in the presence of Moses. He kept pestering Moses, pestering him, pestering him. Make dua, make dua, give me something that I'll become rich. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Yeah, it's, maybe it's not good for you. Maybe Allah is holding back because you may not know what to do with this money. He says, no, I want it, you know me, I'm your cousin. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. You know what he taught him? <laughs> Moses taught Karun a formula that changes sand into gold. Change, uh, everyone is saying, I wish I have this formula now. Huh? <laughs> I don't know it, by the way. Don't come after the lecture. I don't know it. I don't even know what it is. Okay? So, but the Riwaya said that. He taught him how to change sand into gold. The guy became rich to such an extent that Allah, when he describes his wealth, he says, one key to his treasure needs nine men to carry it nine men to carry one key to open one of his treasures over the course of time moses used to send after him it's time to pay you know charity he says what charity i knew i was gonna get this one haji look yesterday you were a beggar yesterday you were holding to my feet and saying moses please 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 now all of a sudden you are saying that i knew i was gonna get it Oh, he kept saying that until Allah says what? He reached a level of defiance against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Allah knew that he is not going to come back. Khalas, he decided, he decided his fate and destiny. Allah did not decide it for him. He decided his fate and destiny. He decided to renege and to rebel. Allah says we opened the land and we made the land swallow all his money and treasures because it's useless. Now the people who used to envy Karun, what did they say? 
They say, oh my God, thank God we didn't ask for what Karun asked. Hmm? So sometimes we don't relate from that perspective. Another time, what do we do? We look up. We never look down. That's why we don't find happiness. Because we feel that others are happy because we're looking up. Ah, look at this guy. They have no problems, no issues. They're always smiling. They're always happy. And then look at themselves in comparison to the one above them. They feel they are a disadvantage. But if they took a moment and look below them, they will see that they are in the same happiness. Because it's relative to the ones below you. And so on. If the one below you looked at the one below him, he will think he's in good term and in good standard. But we never look down, we always look up. That's why we're never happy or we're never positive. We implicate ourselves with being negative. We don't surrender to our own happiness that is found within us because we are not looking in the right places. The third reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to increase your level of patience. You are someone who is absolutely not patient with anything. So Allah slowly takes things away or delays them. But it doesn't mean that Allah is not holding them to answer them. There is a story that says that there was a man who was, yani it's a figure, it's metaphoric, metaphoric. Don't take it literal uh, because people then will shoot me if they take it literal. That a man used to walk and he used to always find a set of print next to him, footprint. Right? So one time he was really desperate for Allah to answer his dua. So he looked for the set of prints. He didn't find them. He said, Ya Allah, now when I need you the most, you're not there. So Allah said, how did you know that I was always there with you? He said, I used to see your footprints. Every time I wanted something, I saw a foot trim walking next to me. Now I want you, you're not there. He said, whose foot trim, footprint do you think is that the one you see in front of you. He said, mine. He said, no, they are mine. I'm carrying you now. Now I'm carrying you. But you don't even feel it. Because you are too engrossed in your wants that they never end. The wants that they never end. So don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Ya Allah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, yani, Allah, look, I, I, sorry to say, but I have a habit. I don't know how to answer a question with yes and no. Because I feel it is not fair to the person who's asking the question. So bear with me. I know there is a lot of questions, but I will not let you sit and go through all these questions at once. Before in banks, uh, before in banks in deposit it used to be called interest now the banks are calling it profit and loss they still call it interest is it still interest money <laughs> or is it profit as interest is haram and you can't take it is it interest can you take it and give it to the poor and needy instead of leaving it in the banks sorry i know this is not the topic being discussed but i will appreciate if you can speak on this uh, uh, topic. Okay. Uh, uh, here there is difference of opinion. If this question, and I'm being very academic here, and I'm not trying to create a rift, I'm being extremely academic. If this question is coming from the perspective of the Sunni school of thought, the Sunni scholars say that whatever the bank gives on any investment with the bank is deemed interest and it's harm. You cannot take it. All right. So if you are uh, a Sunni brother and sister and you're investing money in the bank, you're not allowed to take interest from the bank because it is considered as a form of usury, which is uh, uh, riba, which is called riba. In our school of thought, our uh, maraj of taqlid, they say this. They say if you put your money in the bank without any demands, or negotiation on what the bank gives until so you're depositing your money you don't even ask you don't go window shopping which bank is offering more interest until so you have an amount of money you leave it in that bank the bank says you know here is the investment on your money that you left with us our jurors say this is not ruled as interest it is not interest because you didn't ask for it and if you were not given it you will not demand it 
So there is no consent on the part of you and the bank. There is no consent. The bank goes, invests that money, makes a profit, gives you a percentage on that profit. The Maharaja say you can take it. All right? In fact, the recent fatwa of Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah yani, prolong his life, he says you can even off, leave off your investment from what you put in the banks because it cannot be amounted to interest. It does not fall under that category. And he's speaking from uh, what we call from yani, knowledge. He knows what he's talking about. He's not just saying it for the sake of saying it. He's studied the bank system and he came to the conclusion that number one. Number two, he says that to leave that money in the bank has also serious implications. What are the serious implications? That the bank may go and reinvest this money in something haram. So in order to, what they call it, istinqadul mal, to rescue that money from falling into the haram, you are better off taking it than leaving it in the hands of this monetary institution. And you can use it yourself or you can give it to the uh, poor people or whatever you want to do with it. Also, can I as an individual get the authority to distributing khums and zakat according to my wishes with the permission of the marja'iya? Yes, without a doubt. Which marja'iya is liberal enough to grant me the facility? Go and ask. I'm not their representative. So if you want to distribute it, you are at liberty. Go and negotiate it with the marja. And if he gives you the authority to do it, feel free to do it. And if you want to elaborate more on that, you can come and speak to me in person. And maybe I can give you some hints. SOS, I don't know what that means. 786. All right. Please help if you can, then pray for me. My daughter-in-law daughter keeps my grandchildren away from me. I have two girls and one boy. My, uh, I don't know what it says, my something cries and prays to Allah to inflict the same pain on her. La, please, when she has grandchildren, my son has no say in the matter. I don't like to pray this, but what, uh, what to do? Can you give some dua to me or pray for me? as I am uh, left in pain. I would say to the daughter-in-law, be God conscious, who let your children go to their grandmother, because it is not fair to keep these children away from their grandmother, and you will be responsible from an Islamic point of view, from a moral point of view, from a conscious point of view, from an intellectual point of view, from an ethical point of view, not to keep these children away from their grandparents. If you have an issue, be transparent and discuss the issue. But don't use the children as victims to get at your mother-in-law. That's not Muslim morality is all about. We've been talking about the human Muslim. Forget the fact you are Muslim. Ya Ammi, act as a human. As a human, act. Your humanity should dictate to you not to do something which is so abhorrent. I don't know what the mother-in-law has done, okay? And I'm not coming to the rescue of the mother-in-law now. I am speaking in as far as what the question is. In fairness to the setter, because the daughter-in-law may have another story to tell. Fine, what I say is that we Muslims, in all honesty, it's about time that we learn how to be transparent with one another when we deal with one another. Yani, I know my mother-in-law has hurted me or she has done something to me. Don't hold that grudge until the day of judgment against her. Go to her and say to her, Mom, if there is an issue between you and me, I am married to your son. It is not healthy to keep this issue piling up between us. And if the daughter-in-law takes such a very courageous step, I appeal to our mothers-in-law to also reciprocate the invite and say to the daughter-in-law, I thank you for coming and admitting or wanting 
to discuss the issue. But you know what our problem is? It's our ego. It's our ego. We cannot do it. We wait. Why should I go to her? I am her royal princess. She has to come to my sorry doorstep and even bend. And then I will think if I will make her see her grandchildren. What sort of nonsense is this? Huh? This is this is not even humane, let alone Islamic, in our system of dealing with one another. God is not affected by our obedience to Him or our disobedience to Him. He is not uh, elevated by our worship. Then why did He create us? He created you to give you the free will to understand your value as a human being who has been given the opportunity to cherish the fact of existence because without existence you're a non-entity and Allah reminds us was there a time where man was a non-entity no one knew him he had no existence whatsoever you were basically i was insignificant in creation god created you gave you the willpower the free will the intellect and said to you now you are an entity you are recognized you are something of value you are something of value so show that value in its real essence when you pray, you pray for the elevation of your own value, not for the elevation of God's value. God's value is beyond any kind of, of, uh, of measure in our life. It is to measure our own aptitude, our own capabilities, our own potentials, whether we are indeed capable, given that free will, to acknowledge our existence on a healthy dimension as opposed to a negative dimension. I have heard that if you have committed zina, the only way to ask for forgiveness is to do tawbah. So I want to ask, is there any kafara compensation for it? There is no kafara for the act of zina. If you've done it, it's between you and Allah. If no one knows about it, you don't need to reveal it. Keep it between you and Allah, and Allah is the one that is merciful and can forgive any sins as long as it does not amount to associating partners with him and that means even after death not before yani for example if someone does all the sins but dies and he does not associate partners with allah there is the likelihood that allah will forgive him his sins that's the only thing that allah does not forgive associating partners with him so if you do tawbah even now let's say i god forbid I start to associate partners with Allah. But before I die, I repent. Khalas, finish it. Man, it's gone. There is no question about it anymore. You won't be liable for it. The liability is to die or to go out of this physical existence into the metaphysical world without having entered in a state of repentance or a state of awakening, so to speak. Can you please explain joint family system in light of Islam? Joint family system in light of Islam is not to encroach on each other's privacy or rights. Yeah, you want your parents to live with you and your brothers to live with you and your wife to be in hijab 24-7. Islam says no. Because it's not fair. For simply because your, 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 your uh, uh, brother needs to live with you and your wife has to pay the expense if she's in hijab and be in hijab 24 hours or be locked in her room so that his royal highness can sleep in the couch and watch tv 24 hours and the wife get locked in the, in the islam says you can't do that it is against the morality and the basic standards of human rights if you want your parents and you want to honor them which is something very helpful and very honorable of you you must create a separate chamber for your wife where her privacy is not uh, intrude on where she can for example have even a room with its you know what we call you know its uh, basic necessities such as a kitchen or a bathroom or whatever 
even if it was one room, but she has the liberty to come out and feel free about her space, then Islam says, yes, you can live as a family. Or if you leave a house where it is divided in quarters, where no one sees one another, where I have the right to choose my own furniture, my own curtains, my own food, right? And not be dictated every day what sort of food we're going to cook today by the mother-in-law. Sorry, mothers-in-law, please bear with me, all right? Please bear with me, all right? Because this is practical Islam. If you want cultural Islam, I will keep my mouth shut and I will not preach. But if I'm preaching about practical Islam, practical Islam says when a, when a wife marries into a family, she has the right to her privacy, i.e. she has the right to her food, to her space, to her clothes, to her whatever. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refused for Fatima to stay with him. Refused. So Fatima to Rasulullah was what? He used to say, Fatima nafsi allati bayna jambay. She is the self that is sit right there between my heart and soul. That's Fatima to the Prophet. He says, daughter, you're married now, go to your home. Live your own life. Live your own space. Cook your own dinner. Do whatever you want. No one can dictate to you the color of the couches or the color of the cushions, you know? You can't. This is not marriage. And this, if we can, I don't want to be too controversial. I'll leave it here. Please elaborate on the concept of muta in Islam. How is this different from nikah or marriage? It would be appreciated if you could provide some names of book reading material on the subject. Well, to, from the outset, muta is a marriage. Let there be no, uh, 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 يعني, uh, what do you call it, any uh, uh, misunderstanding that muta is something that is not marriage. In fact, muta is called aqd, contract, just like the marriage is called contract. But one is permanent, as in the permanency is on the basis of the intention of the couples to live together and cohabitate together. Because there is no permanency. Because that particular uh, uh, marriage can be uh, 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 abrogated by divorce. So there is no permanency to it. If divorce takes place, everyone goes in a separate way. The difference between the what we call the uh, 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 permanent marriage and the temporary marriage contract is that two things that is different. In the permanent marriage, the wife inherits the husband. In the uh, temporary marriage, the wife does not inherit the husband. In the permanent marriage, there is no specification of a period of time or a block of time. In the temporary marriage, there is a specification of the time that these two individuals wish to cohabit, cohabitate, cohabitate with one another or live with one another. Now, uh, is the actual cohabitation in the temporary marriage setup deemed a marriage in Quran and the tradition of the Prophet and in the eyes of Allah, yes, it is a marriage. Okay, can we stop it if we want? Huh? Ladies, hello? <laughs> can you stop temporary marriage if your husband wants to exercise temporary marriage? Yes, you can, in one condition. You draw a prenup. Yalla, today is going to be my last day in Pakistan. Okay? You draw a prenup. What is a prenup? You draw a prenup means a conditional contract that when you want to marry permanently with a husband, you put a condition on him not to marry temporary marriage as long as you are married to him. If he signs that contract, that is a consent on his part that he cannot marry temporary marriage and he has to be bound by that prenup if he signs the contract. Yet he cannot go back on that on his word. And why are you putting that condition? You're putting that condition in the sense that if he does go and marry, yeah, he breaks his word or he breaks his, uh, his uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the condition of the contract, 
then you have the right to divorce yourself on his behalf without complications and you will still get your dowry whether he likes it or not. That's practical Islam. All right? I know prenups in this community is unheard of. All right? And I think I've shot myself in the leg already. Okay? But I speak what Allah and Islam and Ahlul Bayt want me to speak. And this is the religion I have been taught. And I need to preach the religion as it has been taught uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, and the Imams. In terms of books, there are a number of books uh, that are written on the subject and they're written in a very academic way and there are a lot of actually papers that have been given in that. In, uh, and by the way, the marriage of the temporary marriage was practiced at the time of the Prophet. It is not something that we invented. All right? And for those who don't know history, I can give you a name of companions who practice temporary marriage. Well, as a result of practicing temporary marriage, they brought into this world very renowned and well-known children of companions from temporary marriage. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam married Asma, uh, the daughter of uh, Asma, daughter of Abu Bakr, and from that marriage, which was temporary based, Abdullah ibn Zubair was born. So Abdullah ibn Zubair is the product of the marriage of temporary marriage. If people don't know history, okay, just as a something to keep in in, in mind. Books, I can't think of the names now, but if you want to send me an email, I have actually few articles and books myself that I can forward to you on the subject. We have respect for all Khalifas and Imams, but why do we quote only Hadrat Ali always? Two, can we read namaz in car instead of missing it uh, if schedule is busy? Firstly, we do not only speak about Imam Ali. If we spoke about Imam Ali, it is because of the abundance of narrations that have been quoted on his behalf. And sometimes there are particular issues that we need to relate to that no one other than Imam Ali spoke about. Unfortunately, and this is a reality. Fortunately or unfortunately. For example, when we speak about the divinity of Allah and how to explain the oneness of Allah, none of the companions of the Prophet, with all respect to all of them, ever spoke about this subject matter. None of them. Ibn Abil Hadid, in his Sharh of Nahjul Bala, or Ibn Abil Hadid is Mu'tazili. Mu'tazili means he belonged to the Sunni school of thought, not the Shia school of thought. Ibn Abil Hadid, when he wrote the uh, 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 um, interpretation of Nahjul Balagha in the preamble, in the beginning of his sharh, in the beginning of his interpretation, he had this to say. The words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are the words of Ibn Hadid al-Mu'tazili al-Sunni. The Sunni Mu'tazili Ibn Abi Hadid. He says, the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib, above the words of people and below the words of the Creator. That's how refined his speech is in explaining matters. Then he says, he says, and in fairness to Ali ibn Abi Talib, at close examination of all the respected companions of the Prophet, Ibn, ibn, ibn Abi Hadid says, I'm quoting him, he says, with all due respect to all the companions of the Prophet, none of them touched even the surface of explaining certain sciences about the Quran and the Prophet except Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then he says, such as the oneness of Allah, the justice of Allah. You know, certain things that Ali ibn Abi Talib was able to speak about, others did not. So we don't, we do not we do not not quote them because we don't want to quote them. No, we don't quote them in certain instances because there is nothing that we can corroborate the subject matter we are trying to address in that particular field. But we can quote them and we do quote them from the members. We say that they said this, they said that. It, it, if, if 
their words and statements corroborate the Quran, we will accept it. We have no issues by accepting it. Can we read namaz in a car? No, you can't read namaz in a car because you have to stand up. One of the conditions of salah is that you have to stand up. You can't be seated down unless you are uh, unable to be in a position to stand up. And my advice, my humble advice, is yes, we do have busy schedule, but let's organize our busy schedule around our salah and not organize our salah around our busy schedule. Okay, just in, yani in uh, the horizon. If we can establish this for sure, you can do your uftar. The only reason why we delay it few moments and not 25 minutes, because that's not ihtiyat, that is becoming pedantic. Okay? Ihtiyat, according to maraja of taqlid, is a maximum of 7 to 10 minutes, not more than that. That's how much it takes for the redness in the east to go away. It does not need 25 minutes or 30 minutes for it to go. And now we don't break our fast until the moon comes out. Sometimes. Well, until an hour later. And we think that we are still keeping our rosa. Habib, the minute the time of rosa open, whether you eat or not, your rosa is open anyway. Do you know that? You're not confined to eating. If the time of rosa has come, and the time is established to have happened, whether you drink or not, you are not considered fasting anymore. It's finished, it's gone, it's over. Your fast is open already in that regard. What you need to do is to establish that the time has actually taken place. Is khums fard or is taqlid? I think we spoke about khums. Yes, it's an article of faith and it has to be followed. Is taqlid an article of faith or obligation that we need to follow? Yes and no. Now, I know there is eyebrows. How is it yes or no? You don't want to be a muqallid, you become a mushtah. Simple as that. You become an expert. You don't have to become a muqallid. Simple. Yani for example, do we have to all be doctors? Yes and no. How? If in a community there are no doctors, what do we have to do? We have to make doctors. Islam says, if in a community there is no engineers, there are no doctors, not only that, Islam takes it even beyond that. If a community there is no, uh, what do you call them, plumbers, plumber, plumber, you know a plumber? If there is a community that does not have a plumber, the whole community becomes responsible to fund someone to go and study the Bachelor of Plumbing. Okay? Tayy. You don't want to become a Muqallid. Fine. Don't become a Muqallid. Become a Mushtarid. Become an expert. Because it is not possible that in every science around the world we need experts and we surrender to them. But only when it comes to what determines our dunya and our akhirah, we want to do it, Ya Allah, Right? Everyone wants to interpret the Quran the way they want. Everyone wants to interpret the hadith as they want. Everyone wants to practice Islam as they want. So imagine if everyone becomes his own uh, uh, information encyclopedia without even having to study the brother's simple, logical question. You want to build a house. In all honesty, would you give your house to a butcher to build? Answer me. It, I'm, 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 I'm giving practical examples. Would you give your home for a butcher to build it? No. You will go and employ the best engineer under the sun to ensure that there is no problem with your house. But you are investing your life do you want you to invest your life in regard to your religion without having the basics in order to save yourself that what you are practicing is right or wrong instead of falling into haram without knowing? Because I don't know 
how to come out of a particular situation or how to interpret a particular situation. In that situation, taqlid becomes yani, something important in order that if you uh, uh, ask, at least you are safe as to what you are practicing and so on and so forth. Why are we questioning that you are not a Shia Khan? Go for Hajj or Ziyara if you have not given khums. Why my husband doesn't want to pray behind me? I don't know. I have already started praying. He said, man has to lead. Okay, sort this problem, domestic problem at home. <laughs> anyway, I think I have few more questions, but I'll leave them with your permission to tomorrow to be able to answer them. Thank you for your attentiveness. Sorry if I raised my voice or tone of voice in answering this question. It was not an attack on anyone. It's just the excitement of the whole atmosphere. And I do not preach at you. I talk with you with the anticipation that we can all grow together in appreciating and understanding uh, our Islam, inshallah. May Allah forgive me if I have been negligent in any point or in highlighting anything that does not or did not make sense or make any point. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, raise your ranks for listening to sometimes the gibberish you have to put up with when I speak to you. And may Allah uh, grant mercy and abundance of his pardon to the loved one of those who have departed among the organizers and the ones who are here, can we all recite for them Surah Al-Barakat Al-Fatiha with Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.